welcome everyone uh, this morning. And it's my task to, uh, and my pleasure actually, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Allen. And uh, I'm going to read the bio because that way I'll be accurate. And then I'll just say a few things and we'll get started. So um, Dr. Kathleen Allen is president of her own consulting firm, Kathleen Associ Allen & Associates. She has been working in organizations for over 22 plus years and consulting with organizations and leaders for 18 years. In her consulting practice, she specializes in leadership coaching and organizational change in human service, nonprofit organizations, foundations, small to mid-sized businesses, healthcare, higher ed institutions, and collaborative networks. Dr. Allen has written and presented widely on topics related to leadership, human development, and organizational development. Dr. Allen is a skilled facilitator of organizational change and organizational development. The earmarks of her work are the creation of shared ownership of the results of a change project, long-term sustainable, sustainable change for organization and increased capacity for staff members and leaders in those organizations. She is the author of Leading from the Roots, Nature Inspired Leadership Lessons for Today's World. Dr. Allen has written many articles and contrib contributed to a variety of books, including The Transforming Leader, New Approaches to Leadership for the 21st Century, that's by Pearson, and Innovation in Environmental Leadership, Critical Perspectives by Redcop Gallagher and Satter White. For the past 40 years, she has consulted with a wide Sorry, my, my mute for some reason went on there. Uh, she, for the past 40 years, she has uh, uh, consulted for a wide variety of foundations in leadership and innovation, including the Kellogg Foundation, McKnight Foundation, Nebraska Community Foundation, the Sardana Foundation, Blandon Foundation, and many others. She has served on the Board of Leadership Learning Community and has been a senior fellow at the Academy of Leadership at the University of Maryland. Previously, she was the Vice President of Student Development at the College of St. Benedict in Minnesota. She has a Doctor in Educational Leadership from the University of San Diego, California. Dr. Allen writes a blog on leadership and organizations describes a new paradigm of leadership that is based on lessons from nature and living systems. You can sign up for her blog on her website and I'm going to put that in the chat, that link so that you have it um, a little later on, you can take a look at that. So I've uh, known Dr. Allen for many years. She and I uh, occasionally uh, uh, participate in the ILA. She participates a lot more than me and I've enjoyed her uh, conversations and uh, she's interested in, in how organizations relate to nature and that's in line with a lot of my common research interests as well. So, so welcome Dr. Allen and I'm looking forward to, we're all looking forward to hearing your talk today. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Spencer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to uh, get introduced to this organization. I hadn't heard about it before, but it sounds like my kind of people coming together to have interesting conversations about in lots of interesting topics. So today I'm going to um, share with you what my take on what um, Mother Nature's lessons would be on change in organizations. So the first big thing that nature, Mother Nature would do is that Mother Nature really doesn't think about change. Mother Nature thinks about evolution. And oftentimes when we do uh, change work in our organizations, it's often to uh, kind of control our position or to create a specific outcome for our products or earn a certain amount of money or whatever. And um, what I would suggest is that uh, um, uh, sorry, I'll go back to gallery there, is that the first lesson that, that Mother Nature would tell us is that the purpose of the change uh, matters. And so with nature, the change that nature engages in is to help the living system of ecosystem to evolve and create conditions, more and more complex, diverse conditions that are conducive to the life of future generations. So therefore, um, 
uh, Mother Nature is not in the change for change sake business. They're not into change for ego business. They're not into, she's not into change for control. She's into change for purpose. How does the system become more resilient have uh, a greater capacity to thrive and adapt to changing conditions. So then um, here's the next lesson for that mother nature would teach us about change that uh, nature is all organized really by deep design. And so that they use living system dynamics and a deep set of design principles that help us help mother nature and help nature and ecosystems continue to manage on their own. And one of the ways that nature evolves a system or changes a system is with information and feedback. So this most simple way nature frames information is through DNA. And so all of our DNA have genetic codes that give us information. But as things evolve in the external environment, the DNA in nature that gets passed on is the DNA of the species that have learned how to adapt to whatever is changing in the external environment. So there's this constant kind of updating of DNA. And the other way uh, nature evolves and changes is through feedback loops. So we have all of these rich, uh, complex feedback loops that either reinforce certain behavior or dampen down certain behavior. So in my consulting practice, what I've realized is that information is an extraordinary tool, not really a tool at, at all, but a process that can help an organization evolve on its own. So I wrote information and information because I've always found that the play on the word information helps us understand the deeper power of information, which is it when we get, get information, we can also become, uh, turn into a, a formation or formation kind of experience for us. So now I ask when I go into organizations and do change work is what information or knowledge could help the system evolve? Here's an example. I um, often do culture audits for organizations who are interested in transforming their organizational culture. And one of my clients, uh, I, in that process, I do qualitative one-on-one -on -one interviews with a variety of people up and down the organization. And uh, then I do a kind of an aggregate themes and pattern framework. And then I go and I report out to every single person that I interview. And often you find that certain pockets know certain information, but it's not generally shared or understood in the organization. And sometimes really critical information shows up in those interviews that when they are shared out in the report out session as themes and patterns, it triggers a significant change. And here's one example. So I was working with one organization. It was kind of had a huge production line the, all of the top leadership uh, were the only, they were the people that had carpet in their offices and everybody else was working on cement as kind of a metaphoric framework. But in the interviews, I found that uh, all of the uh, staff that I interviewed didn't trust the leadership team because they had had confidential conversations with them and they had found that their confidence was not held. Uh, their, what they said was not held in confidence, it was shared. When I shared that with the whole group, including the leadership team, the leadership team people were appalled because they were good people with good hearts and they just didn't see this behavior that they were engaging in. And they didn't see how it fundamentally uh, created a distrust between them and the people that they were leading in the organization. Um, so that I reported out uh, early December on that. And in mid-January, I came back to start work in small groups to do some of the other change work we came under, we had decided to do. Um, and in this process, uh, between December, early December and mid-January, the organization had fundamentally changed all on its own. What happened was that this knowledge was so disruptive and disturbing to the leadership team is that they got together, they met, they realized that in fact, they had been doing exactly what their staff saw them do. And they brought the group back together 
And they stood in front of them as a whole and apologized and said it wouldn't happen again. And that act was something that they self-organized on their own as a consultant. I didn't come in and tell them to do that, but the information led them to choose a set of behavior that then came in. And when I came in six weeks later, the trust and the commitment to continue to transform the organization had already, that momentum had already been set. And it was just a perfect example of how information, how powerful it can be. The second part of the feedback thing is that I now use feedback um, as something to observe, feedback patterns. Where are the rich and diverse feedback loops happening in an organization? And how do I, uh, and where aren't they? So for example, um, I have found that uh, anytime there are pockets of, there are always pockets of dysfunction and, and functionality in organizations. But usually when I bump into a pocket of dysfunction, I then look, step back and look at the feedback. And what usually is happening in the, that pocket of dysfunction is somebody is dampening down the feedback. So sometimes departments, leaders are, you know, just too busy to listen to feedback or they don't want to hear what their staff are saying. Everybody tries to give feedback initially, but if it's not listened to or if it's not uh, responded to, eventually they'll just stop giving feedback and the dysfunction will, you know, expand. So in the absence of feedback, the system and or the department or the individual doesn't have a way to evolve and grow and get better. And so they, they uh, kind of stick where they are and then they, they, uh, they, stop, um, they stop growing and they stop uh, matching what is required in the, an external environment. And also, so in silo organizations, for example, they often have limited internal feedback between them. That's an example. Or sometimes I work with organizations that are so internal, they have rel relatively good feedback loops within the organization, but they are disconnected from the external environment. And when they disconnect themselves from the external environment, by the time I'm coming in, they usually are, uh, they usually have a significant gap between how they're delivering service or product and what the external environment actually needs. And so that makes them maladaptive uh, because they're not listening, they're not noticing. So again, a simple feedback thing is how do you get the organization into relationship with the external environment? And then they see the feedback through scanning and other kinds of things, and then they start evolving on their own. So here's the third lesson. Nature works with the larger system. So if you can imagine having uh, this kind of wild hurricane-like environment or context, and you don't actually plan your change work in relationship to what the context is saying, or in relationship, if this is what the external environment looks like, and you're creating some internal change work that is not connected to that external context, you're going to have a hard time being seen as doing change work that is uh, that matters actually, or that fits the environment. So I, nature always sees the importance of context, which takes all of our change processes that we've been taught that um, have universal application and basically throws it, throws them up uh, and says maybe these aren't the way to go. So. In nature, I have learned that the more, and with organizations, I have learned that the more I understand the context, the more I, the more powerful my work is with an organization. So context matters. So it's always unique. Do ever whatever you do, do it by uniquely by design. And um, the second way nature works with the larger system is that it is designed on two frameworks. One, it has a very large shared purpose in the whole ecological system to create conditions conducive to the support of future life. And it counts on, depends on self-organization and local knowledge to apply and make at, uh, quick adaptations to achieve this larger purpose. So nature already assumes that there is a huge amount of 
bees, ants, plants, flowers, animals that are self-organizing around the larger purpose. And the other thing that nature does is it self-assembles things. So the albacore shell is one of the shell hardest things in nature per square inch. Uh, but that is not that is self-assembled from the molecular level up. So what nature does is it takes the whole system and assumes that there are active living entities that will help support the change if you let it and if you let them in and if you design with that in mind. So now as a consultant, the biggest thing that I now have shifted to in town around change is I ask the question, how do I grow change instead of drive change through the organization? So I'm a gardener and, um, and when you garden, you don't sit by your garden every single day, 24 hours a day, uh, watching the seeds that you've planted germinate. You assume that if you've prepared the soil right, then you've plant, you plant the seeds, the seeds have a livingness to them and they will germinate and they will build a root structure and they will eventually create a little shoot that comes up. So our relationship to the garden is not one of top-down drive control, it's one of um, co-creation, you know, so we're co-creating with our garden space. So the change process, if you think about garden from a gardening framework, you have different states that you go along in and you have time delays. So you prepare the soil, you figure out what seeds you wanna plant, you plant the seeds, you create a, there's a time delay between the germination and the root structure. Then you see the first little shoot that comes up. You provide the nutrients that will help that shoot get better and better. And then eventually what happens is that uh, the plant grows, uh, it starts uh, flowering, it needs cross-pollination to, uh, to bear fruit, and then eventually you harvest. So there's a process and it takes time. But earlier in my career, you know, we would sit down in organizations and we would say, okay, these are my goals. This is what I'm gonna deliver. This is the day I'm gonna deliver it. And then you drive it down through the system, but it rarely holds. The second is, is that because nature is all self-organized, well, the question as a change agent is how do you unleash self-organization around your change initiative? And how do you design it in a way that lets people co-create solutions because that's how they're gonna own the solutions. That's a living system frame. People only support what they help to co-create. And what's the smallest thing I can do now when I'm working with the system that can facilitate the organization's evolution that uses the natural dynamics of self-organization and purpose and interdependence that allows change to emerge. So the, the simple takeaway is uh, the system will help you with your change work if you let it if you design your process that way. So the next lesson from mother nature is that it's, it's structured on a network framework so, uh, filled with connections and interdependence. And networks work differently with change than hierarchies. Um, and here's a, just a simple framework to help you understand interdependence in an odd way. This stream coming through this forest doesn't drink its own water and the trees don't eat their own fruit. Everything in nature is designed to provide and support life of other species in this mutualistic kind of framework. So we don't think in interdependence terms very often in our organizations, but nature is deeply designed that way. So then when I think about uh, applications around this principle of assuming connection and interdependence and creating change in relationship to it. I think in part, this picture is from the great sandbill crane migration. So every year, uh, twice a year, they uh, migrate from Canada to Texas and Texas back to Canada. And I've, been, I've seen this migration in Grand Island, Nebraska, and you'll have close to a million uh, uh, sandbill cranes uh, spending two or three weeks in this central Nebraska town. 
And it is a stunning sight because um, at sunset, you know, maybe 200,000 are on the ground in the wetlands um, nesting for the night. And then you might have another 500,000 coming in and blocking the, sun, the uh, sunset. And just all you see are these kind of black shapes of birds. But what's stunning is that they, they don't run into each other uh, and they yet they do coordinate. They have an interdependent connected framework. And what we now know is that they tend to fly, they fly at the same speed, they fly in proximity to each other and they fly with the same direction and purpose in mind. And so they don't land on top of each other. They, there are no birds fly, dropping out of the sky as they bump into each other. These are big birds with six feet wingspan. It's really stunning. But then what I realize is that this swarming activity in interdependent connected organizations that have network frameworks and all hierarchies have a subculture that's network driven that all change and learning flows down along lines of relationships at the speed of trust. So if your relationships are not optimized, if people don't trust each other, you have to start at the relationship level in order to get people to move forward. That's your germination stage, so to speak. Process matters because the way you bring people together and who you include and who you exclude either strengthens or diminishes trust. And because in an interdependent system, you anybody can initiate change from anywhere. So it doesn't have to be a top-down initiative to transform an organization. And in fact, it tends to all lots of innovation bubble up from the bottom. And so if we can kind of shift our framework of where change and innovation comes from, it could help all of us become more innovative as a, as a matter of nature, so to speak. And we, um, and then the last piece around interdependence is now I always ask the question, if the leadership team wants a certain, let's say a, a stronger distributive leadership culture in an organization, interdependence would tell us that we need to ask them, how are your, how is your behavior uh, part of the problem of not being able to develop a distributive leadership organizational culture? Because they are all part of the problem. It's not that you sit at a leadership table and think about what, what you need to change in others. You have to also look at yourself and ask, what do I need to change in myself? So the next piece is that mother nature is always in movement. When you stop moving, you die. If you put your hand on your heart uh, and listen to your heartbeat or your breath, you know that you as a living system are also part of nature. And nature is always evolving and, and uh, changing. So there's a, a simple structure that has uh, called the adaptive cycle that we've found in our study of nature. It has about 3.8 billion years of R&D. And this is the simple kind of process. The, um, you know, it, you have an explore phase, a launch phase, a sustaining phase and a release phase like an ongoing constant infinity loop. And that's really how nature continues to grow and adapt. But in organizations, um, we have, um, you know, we tend to launch and sustain and spend, spend a lot of energy there. And we tend to have a difficulty releasing and then reinventing ourselves. But in nature, things like fire, is a way of releasing a, a uh, mature system that that has um, become too rigid and doesn't fit what's changing externally. And then it releases all these nutrients and resources that allow for this next stage of exploration to happen and a relaunch or a new launch of the system. So nature, for example, in this launch phase, experiments all the time, but it only replicates what works. That's what gets it to the sustaining framework. So now I look, as I come into a system, I look at this adaptive cycle and I see where is the system? Are they having trouble releasing things? Are they, you know, up here in the explore stage, thinking about all the great things they want to do, but they don't launch anything. We, they get stuck between the idea and the action. Are they up here 
where they've built a whole bunch of forms that used to serve a purpose, but they no longer actually serve purpose. And so they're highly bureaucratic and becoming highly rigid in the process. And so that, some, that tells me that there's, there's a time when they're almost ready to release. For example, I worked with one disability organization and in the US, they had had a very stable kind of revenue stream for, oh, decades, 20, 30 years. Uh, but about six, seven years ago, the, the uh, federal rules changed and all of a sudden their business model was starting to collapse. But because they'd been in this sustaining place for so long, they had lost their capacity to let go of the old model and um, reinvent uh, their, their, uh, their business model for serving that population. So this would be an example of an organization and a whole sector that had become highly rigid in the way they did their work. And so the last five years has been extraordinarily disruptive for them. So then how do you apply this adaptive cycle? So this is a huge oak tree. I have about 12 giant mature oak trees in my backyard and um, oak trees can give us huge lessons on letting go. One of the things that happens to oaks is that they, as they grow and uh, mature, their canopy grows and uh, their trunks get thicker and their can canopy uh, grows up the tree. And so earlier branches down the, down the oak tree who have uh, used to provide a huge purpose by, because they were the canopy or they used to be the canopy, um, uh, actually have a hard time getting sunlight and uh, generating photosynthesis and bringing nutrients back into the tree trunk. So what happens is over time, the, eventually the oak tree decides to withdraw resources to those lower branches that are no longer able because of where they sit in the oak tree and the, where the oak tree has grown and evolved to, to contribute to resources and nutrients. And they create this self-healing scar. And then when a big wind comes off, the, these lower branches broke, break off and um, go back into the soil to generate the next, you know, um, whatever uh, uh, de decaying, uh, trees and limbs will do for the forest floor. And I know this because after every big windstorm or snowstorm uh, in uh, Minnesota, I get to go walk around my garden and pick up my oak branches. So as a consultant in organizations, I'm trying to figure out how do I help organizations build the capacity to let go with the gracefulness of an oak tree? And where is the system failing to launch new ideas? In the nonprofit sector, when I work with them, they are almost always failing to launch things. They, their ideas always outstrip their resources and their perception of scarcity uh, is an emotion that causes them to stop the adaptive cycle, which then disrupts their ability to maintain themselves over time and keep matching the change in the external environment. And then I ask, where is the system developing rigidity and how it's doing things? What forms are they holding on too tightly to? Um, the human organizations, um, we are like nature as human beings in many ways, but we are not like nature in two ways. One is we have kind of a consciousness and we have a set of emotions and our emotions shape what we see and our consciousness also shapes our emotions. And sometimes how we think um, is, uh, uh, causes us to hold on to new forms more tightly. And so we fall in love with our form and we don't always learn how to, okay, is this form, is this way of doing finances or is this way of doing whatever process still uh, fit the function, the purpose of our organization? And if not, we should be letting it go. And, coming up with a new frame. So that's the adaptive cycle. So then what happens is that when nature uses information and knowledge and feedback system, when it sees itself as um, uh, depending on self-organization and local knowledge to contribute to the change work, working with the system, when it sees itself as interdependent, when it sees itself 
in this kind of ongoing movement and natural um, uh, kind of adaptive cycle framework. What happens to the way nature does change is that change becomes embedded in the system over time and integrated into the system. So we, in human organizations, a lot of our change work is something that is dropped on top of the organization and it's kind of cobbled onto uh, the organization and it continues to require resources and supervision and attention to help the organization continue to um, hold that change in place. I call that consumptive change, but with nature, nature kind of sees problems, adapts to problems, integrates the, the solution, and then releases those energies so it can look at the next kind of iteration or challenge that it's meeting. And so this is kind of a natural cycle of you see the challenge, you embed it and work with the system, and then the system creates a uh, co-creates a sustainable solution. It resets itself deeply into the nature's DNA and or organizational. So that's probably our organizational culture. It's how we think, what we, how our thinking and our values shape our actions. So when we do this and we think from a nature's perspective about how to do change, what happens is that it's more sustainable. It's, uh, it happens faster. It happens with less energy. And once you have it kind of changed, it, you don't have to continue to support it because it, it uh, drops into this unconscious level of organizational culture or in nature, it becomes morphogenetic. It basically is a transformation of the DNA of the system. And uh, it uh, is all built from self-assembled on up. So I'll stop there and I'm really uh, interested in the kind of conversations we might have together. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, what we might do first, I can see um, Spencer there. Spencer, did you have a question you wanted to kick off with? If not, we have a few questions in the chat here. I, I would like to just make a, one brief comment and, and, a, and, and offer one short question. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Allen, I must say that uh, I come from this perspective as a biologist first and a social scientist second, and I think you've done an outstanding job, and you've always you always do an outstanding job of of taking lessons from nature and making that connection to social system, which is almost like two different languages, and you, you bring it together in ways that I enjoy tremendously. And I just I just have one comment and a quick question on your adaptive cycle. You mentioned that on that release phase that we humans have trouble with that pretty often and and nature's not as kind in that in that area nature is red and tooth and claw there and that yeah. and and that's where it gets to my question you said that context matters and i agree so in your experiences have any comments as to how entrepreneurial organizations differ in the way they learn from nature compared to more traditional organizations? Oh, great question. Well, first of all, they I do a lot of work with entrepreneurial organizations who are supporting entrepreneurs in the, uh, the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. And what I have found is that entrepreneurs are actually the ones who are inventing and they're much more aligned with nature because they're building their business on relationship and purpose primarily. They're not, um, and, uh, and there, there's this kind of quick um, action response that is very similar to nature. You know, there's this experimentation, learning, adapt, experiment, learn, adapt, experiment, learn, adapt. And, you know, we often think that entrepreneurs have no time for reflection, but they've, their, their energy tends to be, it's all an integrated kind of 24-7 experiment, learn, adapt. So they are in a lot of ways much more aligned with nature than our corporate cultures are. And the other piece is that um, the problem with entrepreneurs is when they grow up and they are successful, they eventually have to cross the chasm and build more infrastructure, you know, like HR policies and things like that. And that's where they start separating from nature is that they learn what we have generated, but what we have generated in the past 
almost all of that is based in a control framework. It's rarely based in a, a nature-based framework. And so all of, almost all of our systems prioritize one part of the system, which happens to be um, money. And uh, so it moves from this kind of organic, natural, or more natural related kind of structure, networked, connected, working together, fast teams, to something, it starts morphing into something that is um, much more hierarchical and uh, control-based. And so it moves more towards an exploitive extractive economy. And so now some of the entrepreneurs that I'm, um, instead of a regenerative economy. So a regenerative economy is based in a worldview where relationships to each other and to the earth are sacred. And the purpose of a regenerative economy is so ecological and social well-being. That's supposed to be the outcome. But in extractive economy, the worldview is really about consumption and uh, top-down, you know, kind of we know best for everybody else. And the purpose is really structured to uh, um, uh, enclose wealth and power. So we have these two economies, and what happens to entrepreneurs is they tend to start out in this regenerative frame. And then when they have, when they become successful, they start listening to our theories and practices and uh, that we have generated over the last hundred years that are all anchored in this extractive economy and, and exploitive economy. And it's not just exploiting money, but it, all many of our organizations are exploiting our, our personal well-being in the service of productivity, for example. So, it's a very um, interesting challenge, but and some of the new, the new entrepreneurs that I'm working with are trying to figure out how to cross that chasm and not end up in, a, in an extractive, exploitive place. So they're inventing, and it's very exciting to see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Ben. Nice to see you, Ben. Um, I can see you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Allen. Um, I was uh, wondering uh, how you uh, uh, conceptualize the role of dissenters, organizational dissenters. Um, you know, my, my experience is pretty much limited to the academic area, a nonprofit academic area. So, um, you know, there's this tradition of, of so-called shared governance. So um, there's more of a willingness of, of the employee, the human resource component of the organization to challenge decisions, um, but, um, um, it seems like in terms of this creative adaptation that there needs to be somebody there who's questioning the status quo. And typically, uh, because we're all under pressure, we all have too little, too little time to do too much. Uh, our, our prestige, our, 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 our identities are on the line um, that dissenters are, are going to be, tend to be viewed negatively. Um, uh, but, and I'm not saying dissent is necessarily a good thing. I mean, I've, I've seen people that some people have a pathological predisposition not to cooperate with other people. I mean, I've just seen it. You know, people, you know, people might be um, even to the point of mental illness. I've seen that. All right. With people yeah. with PhDs. So um, how, how do you conceptualize then the role of, of intra-organizational dissenters or self, people that believe themselves to be self-styled gadflies, right? A gadfly yeah. is a good thing. How do, you, how do you conceptualize the role of dealing with dissenters? Because there will always be dissenters, correct? They will always right. be there. So, no in, how, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, in uh, in the quantum world and also in nature, um, uh, uh, resistance is required for wholeness. So, basically, opposition is necessary to understand the whole system. And when we create structures in our organizations that dampen down uh, opposition, what happens is is that not only does it cut us off from a feedback loop but it also limits the way we see the system. And we, now, we know that in systems theory that um, when you, the only way you, um, the more you optimize a part, the less you optimize the system. And when you add the, another layer of the dynamics of having a networked organization, where you sit shapes what you see. So when you have these complex dynamic networked organizations that are existing within a hierarchy, our hierarchy often trumps and makes this network dynamic and culture disappear. 
But in a network framework, the more people's perspectives that you can understand, the better you understand the whole system. It's like that old Chinese proverb of, you know, five blind uh, monks trying to figure out what an elephant looks like, and they're all touching a different part of it. And so the leadership question shifts from how do I overcome resistance or dampen it down or shut it down to how do I welcome resistance? Because that actually makes a better framework. Another leadership shift is not who's going to make this change, but what interactions in an interdependent system will make this work or not. Um, what do I need to control goes to what do I need to unleash, unleashing the self-organization. Instead of how do I change the individual, you're trying to change, you're working at the level of the field, the culture of the place. So you're trying to influence the field that will influence a whole bunch of individual behaviors. So the gadflies, um, you know, I think that sometimes the gadflies are folks who um, have a really extraordinary asset, which is they've been passionate about the mission of a place and they care about what it wants to be. This is at their best, I guess you could say. But on the flip side, they, um, uh, they have been hurt. Uh, and so they have withdrawn from the system. And so they're basically there to throw pot shots in to uh, the circle of engagement, whatever that is. So there's some humanness of this and past trauma. You know, the, uh, Philip Bilior wrote this really beautiful book called Stuck with a question mark. And he uh, thinks organiza his work is, he's out of Belgium. He is, his work is uh, in corporate culture. And he thinks that um, we keep trying to fix organizations and fix trauma, but you can't fix trauma, you can heal trauma. So you have to look at it from a living system and that's how you help work through some of the resistant behavior that is um, that is really dysfunctional. But in general, I think when people come up with something radically different than what the prevailing thinking is, it tends to be beneficial and it creates more resilience for the organization later on, even if people are disrupted because they don't want to hear that piece of feedback about how different parts of the organization experience the organization. So that, I, I'm a big fan of resistance, actually. I think um, we, uh, in the sense that we can't understand the wholeness without all the different perspectives. That's one of the things that COVID has done for us over the last two years is it's, it's created more opportunities for us to uh, see the fragility of our systems and the fracture lines in their systems and the different understandings of how um, people's lived experiences are from the prevailing status quo. And it will help us over time become better, I think. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Sol. Sol, did you want to um, unmute yourself to ask your question? I'm hoping that if not, I could always read it for you if you're not able to unmute yourself. I'll go ahead and read it then. Um, sorry, now I have to scroll back into the uh, chat box. Hi, uh, my name is Sol. A pleasure to meet you. I'm a teacher at university. I have a question for you. How to generate a positive environment in an organization with people with very different thoughts who all feel like leaders and who resist working in union and harmony? <laughs> Uh, this is the process. This is the work that we actually have. This is, so one of the things about living systems and nature is that patterns scale. And so you have oftentimes patterns that are happening in the local environment have an echo, just like a fractal, a ge geometric fractal at, at multiple levels of scale up to the global. And so uh, the flip side of your questions, um, Sol, is if we can't learn how to do this at our local level, how can we ever learn how to do it at our global level? Which is how do we help people see how to, that uh, collaboration and working together and understanding our interdependence and connection matters. 
Because if we don't understand that interdependence and connection, then we will still be destroying the earth X number of years from now. And we won't be uh, because we don't see ourselves and our actions in relationship. And we keep prioritizing our own frameworks um, and own rights over the connection and responsibility of the whole. So nature never has that argument. You know, it's not that there isn't conflict or destruction in nature because, you know, we're going to have more and more of the, the same events that we've been having in the recent past. And they're going to be more um, intense because nature is, is uh, there's a whole bunch of feedback that hasn't been listened to. And the one thing about feedback that I know personally and organizationally is that when feedback is not listened to, it gets louder and stronger until you can't ignore it anymore. And so the um, uh, so you're, if you keep ignoring on a personal level messages about your health, eventually your body will shut down and you'll have some kind of medical crisis, for example. Organizationally, if, if there's a lot of feedback around an individual leader or an organizational culture, eventually that pushback, if it can't be done inside the organization, it will be, people will leave. And that's really, I think, in part what the great resignation is all about that we're seeing. So the question, the way I try to get people to move from um, autonomy to connection and interdependence is uh, one is I try to help them connect their self-interest to the common interest and help them see how um, a kind of a, an enlightened self-interest approach, you could say, is helping them see if they choose to continue to, the behavior of separation and non-cooperation in a world that's more and more connected and interdependent. Eventually, they're, they're, the way they're working is just going to keep creating disruptions for them and problems for them. So I try to hook them uh, through, first of all, through information. Like what is the information that is shaping their worldview and what additional information could help shift their worldview, uh, which then in turn might shift their behavior. Um, the um, other piece soul is um, a lot of our change, there's one of the things that we rarely think about when we think about change work or leadership is human development. And um, everybody has a developmental kind of pattern or, or a journey that they're on. And sometimes I know that when you have um, uh, this kind of human development background, you can also see people individually and why, where they might be that is shaping their, their uh, movement towards understanding connection and interdependence. Uh, and so that would be another framework is try, pay attention to where they are developmentally because people always start out with autonomy, but eventually they get to interdependence. Um, we have another question in the chat here that I'm gonna read. Um, from Mansi. Um, I hope that I do these questions justice by reading it, reading them out. Um, considering Mother Nature, as is the famous saying, nature always does justice. The hard work you put results in fruits, but it is not always the same in organization. It is complex. People do face failures, sometimes consistent failures, especially we have all witnessed a plethora of startups failing despite um, hard work. You, um, so can you please explain how does nature teach us how to deal with such failures of co and complex crisis situations? Well, first of all, nature is a highly dynamic, interdependent, complex situation. Uh, it's a system that is exactly the echo of what we're facing in organizational life. The thing about organizational life that often causes us to fail is that we don't actually think in complex, dynamic, interdependent ways. We think in complicated, bureaucratic, and simplistic ways. And um, so, for example, when you see a problem in an organization as a complicated problem, what you do, your strategy, your most effective strategy is to drill down, figure out what parts aren't working, fix the parts, build it back up, 
that's a complicated approach. So you're and that you always analyze downward. But in a complex uh, dynamic system, your strategy and your meaning making and your understanding is not found in the details because it's too it's always moving. So the new variables always continue to show up and they change. So your your strategy comes from the meta level. It comes from the balcony, you know, so you go up instead of down. So if you are in organizations, if you're trying to solve complexity and complex issues through a complicated frame and of analysis, you are doomed to fail on a regular basis. So you have to shift your intuitive training. And this is all about training. We've trained people to think in complex ways, but we haven't trained people to think in, compli uh, in complicated ways, but we haven't trained people to think in complex ways and how, how they're different. So now when I'm working in organizations and complexity, themes and patterns are basically the things you surface because they, it's like, um, you know, the old metaphor of the dance floor. If you're on the dance floor, you can't see the pattern. You have to go to the balcony and look over the balcony to see the patterns on the dance floor. And then you can make meaning of what's going on. And so I'm always at a pattern piece, but I'm also teaching and developing people to see patterns as opposed to see the details all the time, because that helps them in working with their teams, working with themselves, working with each other, uh, working with the external environment to build much more robust strategy. So you get, you uh, first of all, go for, comp for complex dynamic systems, you go to pattern, and then out of pattern comes strategy and out of strategy um, comes, it, it helps you see where you can uh, influence the system. And you also have to move from a system. Complicated situations are closed system problems. So control is possible, but in a complex situation, control is not possible. So you have to look at where you can influence as opposed to what you can control. And that's another kind of, problem that organizations that fail to really embrace the complexity of something is that they're still bringing these control energies and um, uh, closed system frameworks to uh, their organization. And it's, it's, uh, you have to hold it lighter, you know, it takes a lot of energy to hold your fist, but if you hold things more lightly in your organization, which includes your understanding of how things are moving and changing and what's current in the pattern for recognition piece. It's like weather, think of weather systems. If you're gonna you know, try to apply this, you know, what does the, there's a lot of data in a weather system forecast, but, the, um, but you're looking for patterns. You're not looking for how much, how many drops of rain are gonna fall on this um, house at any given time. So you, you there's a whole different set of questions that you're asking to understand complexity. I don't know if that helped, but. Okay, we've just got a lot of questions in the chat all of a sudden. Um, could I call on Angelica? Angelica, are you there? If not, I can read your question. Uh, one second, let me. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Dr. Allen. So I just have a quick question. So I have a few family members in the military and going back to Ben's question and a little bit of what you just answered um, on like would Ben how resistance can be good for organizations and how you said that maybe like um, having like, you know, having someone's ideas put, put on someone is destructive. But how about like in the military where that is their main framework of uniforming their workers um, rather aggressively? Um, is there any way that can be effective in, you know, creating organization structures or is it more destructive? Is there a balance? Um, could we use it in more commercial um, environments or what is your take well, on that? Um, the military is interesting because on the surface, it looks like it's a very tightly um, linked, uh, you know, top down do what your supervisor says. But in the, there's nuance also in the military, especially in the US that, um, that allows them to focus on what is the purpose of the mission. And then uh, if they get cut off from command and control, there's 
still this ability to achieve purpose when you don't have direction. So there's, there's layers to our um, and complexity to the military system that I think on the surface, most people don't see. One of those layers is that, um, uh, that one of the principles for not maybe everybody in the military, but uh, a number of, of leaders in the military is uh, a concept of complete staff work, which assumes that the person that's receiving the order or the request for information or whatever will create a high quality product that is a com, uh, what they would call completed staff work, which is thought of. And so it's it's a um, a nuanced version of unleashing self organization. They're asking the person to think to for themselves and get all of the nuance and complexity and generate and bring that back in a package to their next person up. But that said, um, hierarchies, this is a human development thing. Hierarchies uh, rarely see how they're part of the problem of limiting information and feedback to them. So the pressure uh, in the human pressure in hierarchies is that we, we shape our communication for the worldview of the person that's supervising us. So pretty soon what happens is there's more and more, there's less and less honest feedback that gets up to the top of the system. And then the people at the top are only dealing with information that has been modified um, to, uh, because they don't, don't think they can actually hear the truth. And so they have a very distorted view of what people really think and want at various levels in the organization. So this, is, uh, this, uh, this has been well-researched in the field and they, and it is, um, and so getting honest feedback in a hierarchical situation is one of the biggest challenges that because the culture tends to work against that. Um, I don't know if that helps your question around the military or not, but that's the nuance and complexity of being in that kind of system, especially if you care about the larger purpose of what the system's designed to do. And if you care, then you're going to have this kind of oppositional energy that we need to be paying attention to X, Y, or Z, and maybe or maybe not getting traction there. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions that I, um, I just want, I'll read the first one out is from Bart. Um, Bart asks, does that mean that most, if not all challenges with respect to people are complex challenges? Oh yeah. Well, uh, there are simple things. So this comes out of the Kinefin framework that um, um, Boone and, um, oh crap, what was his name? Uh, but C-Y-N-E-F-I-N, check it out. There's lots of really cool YouTube uh, videos on it. And um, uh, the Kinefin project uh, is, uh, is a framework and I have used it. He doesn't use it developmentally. He uses it in a decision-making framework. And, uh, but I've used it as a developmental framework. So he would say you, you have simple problems which are, you know, the, the solution is known, the problem is understood, and uh, so you apply best practice. You have complicated problems, uh, and which means that you have to analyze first, and then after you've analyzed all of the parts, you then apply best practice because there's more than one way to solve the problem. But the, both of those are framed in closed system frameworks. Uh, but then you cross over, this is like a simple four square, right? You cross over to com complex problems, which is about emergent practice because there's so many variables and the variables keep continuing that you can't see the system from by just analyzing it. You have to see the emergent patterns that are happening and you apply emergent as in ongoing experimentation with intent and consciousness. And then down in the left-hand corner of the, of the chart is novel problems or chaotic situations where you have to apply novel practice. So in human organizations, sometimes in human development, sometimes we do have simple things like 
you know, I got to go to the grocery store and because my refrigerator is empty. And you kind of know what that process is. But most human development things that we're facing these days, like adapting to um, a pandemic, um, trying to figure out how to work from home with kids in the background, all of those things tend to be much more in that complex category. And you're growing and learning. The beautiful thing about nature is, and human beings is that we are designed to evolve and learn and grow and get better. And it's only our resistance to them mentally or emotionally that stops that adaptive cycle of learning and growing where we, we hold on too tightly to previous images of ourselves or we uh, don't think we can do certain things. And so we don't let go and we don't explore. So, so human, I love human dynamics because it's, it is always complex and emotions are always a part of it. And, um, but if you assume that people actually are predisposed predisposed to learn and grow, it is more helpful, I think, for, for me anyway, to uh, realize that, yeah, we're, we have the yeah. We have an opportunity. We just have to figure out a way what information might help, what feedback might help. How can I create an experience where a person can um, learn, grow, or be attracted to something that they, they might need to know to get better and not keep running into problems for themselves? All right. We have one more last question from Caitlin that I'm going to read. Um, Dr. Allen, thank you for enlightening us on the need for synergy and dynamic inter interdependence. Are there any concrete examples of current organizations or leaders that you could provide who do this well that we could model after? So uh, this is one of our problems, I think, in our uh, business uh, literature is that we tend to say, okay, who's doing this? And then we, we say, oh, how can I do exactly what they're doing? But when you appreciate context, uh, the, those individuals, you know, like there was this book, uh, you know, The Pursuit of Excellence. And within five years of that book, uh, most of the organizations that were lifted as, as prime objects to learn from um, were not excellent anymore. They had, had gone through some kind of uh, major disruption and they didn't solve it well. So um, I, would, I would suggest instead that you look to people that you are, know in your system and ask the question, who is, um, who is leading from a relational framework? You know, who prioritizes um, and talks about how things connect? What the language of interdependence uh, can be easy to spot if you start noticing. So the language of separation is, is the language of business right now. And um, how do we, in the language of relationships and emotions and uh, people and growth and learning is not necessarily, it's a little soft for, for our business literature. So I would instead suggest that you go locally and you say, who are, who's really doing good work? And then you go ha approach them and have a conversation and ask, would you be interested in being interviewed? Uh, and uh, tell me what you think and how you think and why you're doing what you do. It's, I've had some coaching clients that do this as a regular practice as they develop their own leadership, as they they look to their local community and they say, who's doing good work? They approach them. Most people are very open to sharing and they have a set of questions that they ask them uh, and they learn and they develop their own kind of process. And they, they also begin to see the difference between how a person appears and how they actually show up in their local community or organization. Um, but I have found that the organizations and the people I work with, none of who would you would know by name, but um, they are the ones who are leading this way are, um, their teams uh, are uh, stunning. They have, uh, they're high performers, 
they're excited. Uh, the team members, when they describe their supervisor or leader, they say, this person knows me in a unique way. They understand what my strengths are. They help me utilize my strengths. They don't treat us all the same. Those are some of the languages that, and then they, they work hard and they work together and they work in relationship to each other. And so there is a technique that people are out, out there already using. And our job is to notice who they are, but usually they're people that are doing, uh, that are working with teams that are really very effective and they're known to be effective. So I would look there first and then do your journey. Learn.